So now I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speaker. Celine Gamble is project manager at the Zoological Society of London, the ZSL, and she's also a visiting researcher at the University of Portsmouth. She's working on marine habitat restoration in the UK, and I believe you've actually been down in Portsmouth in the last day or two, Celine. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to hand you over to Celine for what's going to be a really fascinating talk. So stopping sharing. OK, over to you, Celine. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screens. Um, share. Is that all showing correctly? Yeah, that looks fine. Sorry, I'm still on a bit of a sneak preview there. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. um, thank you very much, Maria. Um, and thank you very much for having me here this evening. I'm delighted to be um, presenting um, all about oyster restoration in the UK and uh, what we're doing to restore a forgotten ecosystem. So um, as this is kind of the London um, Natural History Society, many of you will know about um, Zoological Society of London. For those who don't, it's an international conservation charity dedicated to creating a world where wildlife thrives. And um, we have the two zoo sites, so one in London and one in Whipsnade. I'm based in the Conservation and Policy Department. And the work of my team ranges from the European eel conservation, fish monitoring on the River Thames, and also marine habitat restoration, including oyster restoration. Um, and as Maria mentioned, today I'm going to be talking all about um, how, how we're restoring a forgotten ecosystem in the UK. So when I say the word oyster, what first springs to your mind? Um, for many, I'd like to guess that um, it, you're most familiar with oysters served in a seafood restaurant or on a fish bar in, in a kind of supermarket. Um, and that's because we have a really rich oyster eating history around the globe, really, and particularly in the UK. So humans share an intimate love affair with oysters. So the Romans were particularly keen on the native oyster and records show that they ate them in their thousands during feasts. And this is a drawing of Oyster Day in 1835. And it's a drawing showing the arrival of the first oysters of the season at Billingsgate Fish Market. And this was a really significant day for the working class as oysters were a really staple part of the diet, really nice high protein, and they were also incredibly cheap. You could usually buy around four for just one penny. Um, now you'd be lucky to purchase just one oyster for around two pounds. So um, this is a, another drawing, um, also from London. It's from Ludgate Hill in London from 1823. And um, it shows kind of a group of guys eating oysters in, um, in an oyster bar. Um, and I think I've got a, a Q&A that's coming up in a poll. Um, so I was going to ask um, the group what your thoughts were on how many oysters were eaten um, annually in the London market in the 19th century. So the options that we have are on your screen. So 1 million, 2 million, 10 million, 20 million, 100 million or 200 million. Um, around that time, the London population was less than 2 million. So in case that gives any, um, any ideas on that. I'll let the poll run for a little bit more. Um, and then also the other image on this screen um, is kind of an oyster selling um, stall. And you would have previously seen many um, kind of vendors selling oysters along the streets of London um, back in the 19th century. OK, I think we've had 90 percent of people vote. Um, the most popular vote is 10 million. Um, and I can confirm that it was over 200 million native oysters were sold annually. So I think that shows just how popular they were um, in the 19th century. So um, I was quite surprised seeing that figure myself. Um, so um, yeah, I'd imagine a few of you are as well. Moving on to the next slide. Brilliant. Um, however, the European native oyster, once it's in its natural underwater habitat, comes to life and they're capable of forming reef-like structures, supporting a wide variety of biodiversity and also as filter feeders, they can contribute towards cleaning our marine habitats. Some of you may have spotted um, this tiny little spiny seahorse. And this is an image that was taken in Courbon Bay in France. And lots of different marine wildlife are attracted to the assemblages and reefs that oysters can form. So I've got an oyster um, family tree here, um, kind of just to do, do an introduction before going into further um, depth about oyster restoration. So oysters are sessile bivalve mollusks. And here you can see the true oyster family tree. And as a group, they're over 500 million years old. And there are almost 30 different species of true oysters in the world. 
So in the UK, you can typically find the European native oyster, so uh, with the Latin name Austria edulis, and also the Pacific, the Pacific oyster called Crassostria gigas. Um, and the European native oyster is the only oyster that's actually native to the UK coast. And the Pacific oyster was introduced in the 1965 to replenish low stocks of the native oyster. And now they're kind of a former part of, um, of a fishery in, in the UK. And here, the image on the right, you can see a biogeographic range map of the native oyster. Um, it doesn't, it's not showing areas where oysters are now, they've heavily declined, but this just shows um, areas that they can inhabit in Europe. And you can see that they're native to the Atlantic coast from Morocco to Norway, the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. So I just wanted to cover some information on how you can identify a native oyster. Um, and there's, there's two different shells. They've got a lower um, left, which is depicted on the left at the top here. It's a convex shell and an upper flat valve. Um, and they have a rounded rough shell. They're kind of pale, pale yellow green in coloration. They can grow up to around 15 centimeters in shell height. Um, and they also have contracentic bands. So um, some kind of curvature on the, on the shell as well. And they're typically found within the shallow subtidal estuarine coastal habitat. And then with the Pacific oyster, um, they have an elongated shell, which has sharper and more curved edges. And they're typically around a, a purpley pink coloration. Um, they're normally established in the intertidal zone in coastal areas and muddy estuaries. So you might have been able to spot some of these whilst walking at kind of low tide along the shoreline. Um, there's particular areas in Kent where I think this is um, this is the case, although I've not seen them myself. Um, and the, yes, the, the Pacific oyster can be commonly found around the coastline of the UK and Ireland. Um, and particularly, they've formed significant reefs like feral populations in Cornwall and Devon and also elsewhere in the south coast of England as well. So I've got some more polls coming up now um, to, to test some ID skills. Um, so I think we're about to put um, the poll up on the screen. Um, and my question is, using the information from the previous slides, um, do you think these oysters are native or Pacific? Or it's not an oyster? Might be, might be some trick questions in there. So remembering those key things to look out for, particularly along the edge of the oyster. I'll just add in, Celine, that the polls are anonymous, so we can't oh, yes. see who's saying what. So even if you're still not sure, have a guess. Uh, that, yeah, nobody will know what you've put. Absolutely. I don't feel embarrassed. Not at all. Thank you. OK, it looks like 70, nearly 80% of people have voted now. That's brilliant. Um, so I think we can end the poll, perhaps. Yep. Yeah. Um, so. 65% of you were correct. Um, it is indeed a Pacific oyster in this image. Go on to the next slide. And another poll coming up, um, whether this is a native or Pacific oyster. Well, lots of votes coming in. Brilliant. I do think that in some lights, the oyster shell can look quite, um, quite nice. Some people tend to disagree, but I think sometimes in the, in the right light, they can show a kind of purpley um, hue as well, which is quite nice. Okay, so we've had 78% of people vote and I can confirm the 96% of people were correct. This is indeed a native oyster. I'm gonna go to my next slide. Okie doke. Um, so yes, I just thought I'd put the oysters kind of side by side for you. Um, and you can see in both hands, there's one native and one Pacific, and they've actually been opened up. So you can see the inside of the oyster and then the outer shell as well. I'm not sure why, but there's, I think there's some annotations on the screen. Oh, there we go. Um, so yes, I, um, this slide is showing the life cycle of the native oyster. Um, and it's kind of, I'm not gonna go through every step, but some of the steps in this diagram are useful with regards to the science behind the restoration that we're carrying out with the species. So native oysters typically start spawning when the surrounding water temperature reaches around 15 to 18 degrees. So in the UK, this is typically around May to June. However, the time of year will vary um, with the biogeographic range, climate change, and also annual fluctuations. The um, fertilization is internal. So the fertilized eggs remain in the brood chamber for about a week to 10 days, and then the um, the D-shaped larvae are then ejected into the water column. 
So the oysters are also protandrous hermaphrodites. So the juvenile native oysters begin life as male and then they swap between genders after each breeding attempt. Um, so sex changing of the parent oyster can occur as soon as the oyster has released its gametes. And, and because of this kind of trait, it means that several spawning events can happen within the same individual um, within a single breeding season. So moving around the diagram here, so around 17 to 26 days, the live larvae will then start to actively try and find a suitable settlement site. Um, and actually they kind of secrete an invisible foot and then when they settle on um, a suitable substrate, it secretes a kind of liquid cement that actually secures the oyster onto that settlement site, meaning that they don't kind of move from that site once they've um, selected it. The oyster then undergoes further metamorphosis, whereby the foot is reabsorbed and the oysters then become immobile. Um, and within 48 hours of settlement, the oyster will then start to filter feed and grow um, to around the size of one to two centimetres in their first year. So oysters are also characterized by their water filtering abilities. So they feed on um, particles suspended in the water column, such as algae, detritus, um, for example. And this video on the screen um, is a four hour time lapse video. Um, the left tank showing the clarity of the water without any oysters inside and the right showing a tank of around 15 to 20 oysters. I'll just play that again so we can see it whilst I'm talking, oops. Yes. Um, so a single oyster is capable of filtering around 200 litres of water in just one day, and that's the size of around the average bathtub. So when you times that by the millions of oysters that can come together when a, when a healthy reef is formed, you can see how it provides an ecosystem that's vastly powerful enough to improve our coastal water quality. I'm just going to let that finish running. Um, so that was the end of the four hour period. So I just wanted to include an example of what this looks like, practically speaking. Um, so this is um, an image on the right, at the left, sorry, is um, from Chesapeake Bay in the United States. And historically, the oyster densities in this bay cleaned the entire volume of the bay in just three days. However, it suffered a kind of very um, prevalent decline of oysters. And now, um, given the current population of oysters, it takes over a year to filter the same kind of volume of water. And this has contributed to large areas of dead zones and buildup of, of nutrients and, um, and seen kind of um, an, an imbalance in the equilibrium of that bay. I should say, actually, they're trying to restore oysters in Chesapeake Bay, um, and they're increasing the numbers vastly through their restoration efforts. So oyster reefs once dominated many temperate and subtropical estuaries on Earth, but centuries of resource extraction, coastal degradation have pushed this ecosystem to the brink of ex functional extinction worldwide. So there was a paper that assessed the condition of reefs across 144 bays and 44 eco regions and worldwide the condition of oyster reefs is recognized as poor or worse. And over the past 150 years our global oyster reefs have declined by 85% um, due to overexploitation, disease and habitat loss and of those remaining only one third over one third are so depleted that they no longer function as ecosystems, particularly those that you can see in red here on the map, including Europe, North America and Australia, indicating that oyster reefs are one of the most threatened marine habitats on Earth. So this is an example of an image of a remnant um, oyster reef of a different species um, in Tasmania. And I just love this image because for us in the UK, it's kind of what we're trying to strive for. Um, you can see the kind of three dimensional structure that it's starting to form and the kind of vast amount of marine flora that's attached to it as well. So just coming back to kind of Europe from that global perspective. So our European native oyster has declined by 95% since the 1950s um, due to the same reasons as the global decline. So disease, habitat loss and overexploitation. And in the UK, we have just a few remaining populations which can be found around the west coast of Scotland, the south of England and in areas such as the Solent and the River Fowl. And basically the way that oysters have been fished out by dredging takes out both the live oyster, but it can also take shells out the system, which when I was talking about the settlement site preference of the oysters, the shell is actually that preferred site um, for oyster larvae to settle on. So by taking the live oysters and the shell out of the system, we're kind of giving the oysters not the best kind of fighting chance to, to remain thriving. And it's thought that around um, the British Isles, we had oyster beds that 
once was the area of, of the size of Wales. So our, our native oyster is on the path to extinction and large scale restoration efforts are required to bring them back, which in turn will benefit both people and also wildlife. So I've got an infographic here on the screen showing um, a few of the reasons why we're wanting to restore native oysters further to the ones I uh, mentioned at the beginning. Um, so it's not just the water filtering that they can do. Um, oysters are recognized as ecosystem engineers and provide a range of services through the structures that they create and their biological processes. So this infographic shows the provisioning services, the regulating services, and also cultural services, showing that they can enhance the biodiversity, creating reef habitat with shelter and food for other marine life, such as wildlife, uh, wildlife such as birds. And they can increase fish production and support fisheries through the nursery areas they create. And also they do provide an important food source and a source of cultural value um, for us as well. So although they're small in size, they are capable of making some big changes in our marine environment. So um, I think it was last month on World Oceans Day, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration was launched. Um, if you haven't heard of this decade um, previously, then I'd recommend Googling it and, and kind of finding out more. They've got a really great website that um, has a profile on all the different kind of global restoration efforts that are going on. And the aim of the decade is to prevent, halt, reverse um, the degradation of ecosystems on every continent and in every ocean. And it's all about creating a narrative about restoring our ecosystems. And it's all centered around this hashtag generation restoration. Um, and our projects um, and at ZSL, we're really pleased to be an official supporter of this UN decade. Um, and this graph I just thought I'd put here showing the kind of, um, it's, it's from a paper um, showing the growth in global restoration projects um, over uh, since the 1960s. And you can see that globally there's now over 1,700 oyster restoration projects. And you can also see the growth in other marine habitat restoration projects as well, including mangroves, seagrass, salt marsh, coral reef and kelp restoration. So now kind of talking, how can you go about um, restoring oyster habitat? So to know how to restore them, we've identified the barriers to the oyster recovery. So we've got a low number of mature reproducing oysters in the system. We've also got that lack of suitable habitat for them to grow on and thrive. And the third one is that historically they were a really kind of important part of our cultural heritage all around the UK. But nowadays they're kind of lost from living memory and we're seeing the kind of shifting baseline um, syndrome and, and, and people don't know um, kind of the benefits that they have for our marine environment. So um, over the past five to 10 years, we've had 11 um, oyster restoration pro projects pop up in the UK. And also we work with a range of projects in Europe as well. So there's 23 across Europe in total. Um, so in 2018, we set up a network um, which by, um, by ZSL and the University of Portsmouth, and we're working to facilitate the ecologically coherent restoration of native oysters. And on that national scale, we've been really trying to do that through kind of sharing best practice and communications between all our projects in the UK, but then also working really closely with um, our sister network across Europe called Nora. So I wanted to include this example, um, given that it's the London Natural History Society. Um, so this project is another project that we have at ZSL, um, and it's the Essex Native Oyster Restoration Initiative. And on the screen here, you can see the two local oyster fishers that we work with. So there are seventh and eighth generation oyster fishers, the father and son, um, and they have come on board and, and, and well, they've kind of facilitated and um, kind of been actively involved with the setup of the Essex Native Oyster Restoration Initiative. And the vision of the project um, is for self-sustaining populations of native oyster in Essex that in turn provide those ecosystem services, sustainable fisheries and increased biodiversity and also recognising their cultural importance. And the project is a huge partnership between universities, NGOs and I, like I say, these local fishers. Um, and it's a really nice example of a project and something that's really neat is that they, they sell their um, oysters in Billingsgate fish market. They then collect the oyster shells um, that have been used um, for kind of consumption. And then we actually recycle those shells that then go back into the system to try and restore the oysters. 
So on this next screen, I've got um, a video of a culch deployment in a restoration box that we have in Essex. Um, and this is showing the introduction of the, the substrate, including some of those old oyster shells back onto the seabed. And by doing this, we're actively encouraging the oyster larvae to settle and grow on those areas. Um, I think it's quite impressive. They have to use such a huge barge because obviously the volume of the shell material is, is quite vast. So also as part of the network, we've also produced um, some how-to guidance documents. So all of these available on our website, um, if you're interested or, or know someone who might be interested. Um, and it includes all the information that someone would need to set up their own oyster restoration project. Um, and as, alongside with this, we've also partnered with um, the BSAC Divers um, Group, and we ran a photography competition to try and identify remaining oyster populations around the UK, um, which also uh, shown some really nice images, um, including some of the ones on the screen here. So earlier I touched on why we want to restore native oysters, um, including all the ecosystem services they provide, and this in turn has benefits for a huge range of different stakeholders, including the local economy, recreational fishers, coastal communities, and commu uh, commercial fishers as well. Um, and of course, nature lovers and um, swimmers and holiday makers as, as well. So I wanted to include another kind of site specific case study of um, a relatively new project um, called the Wild Oysters Project, which was set up in June 2020. And it was developed as part of a collaboration between the Zoological Society of London, the Blue Marine Foundation and British Marine. And it's funded by the People's Postcode Lotteries Dream Fund. And the aim of the project is, again, for the UK seas to have that self-sustaining population of native oysters, which in turn provide all those benefits that I've mentioned previously. Um, so we've set up restoration hubs in England, Scotland and Wales, and in each of those sites we've introduced oyster nurseries. So here um, on the left is an image of an oyster nursery, um, which is basically um, 30 mature native oysters stacked into um, this structure here, which come the summer months, so approximately now actually, will be starting to release their oyster larvae back into the system. And we're also carrying out um, seabed restoration. So we'll be carrying out the um, shell deployment, which you saw in that video, in each of our three sites in a nearby location to our oyster nurseries, which are housed in those marina sites. We're also going to be delivering um, an extensive education outreach and um, programme to local primary schools um, and secondary schools and also universities as well. So um, yeah, here you can see the locations of, of our sites. So we've got sites in the Firth of Clyde in Scotland, the northeast of England in Tyne of Weir, and also in North Wales in Conway Bay. And in total, we've got 142 oyster nurseries that have been clipped in underneath marina pontoons, which we expect will release over 9 billion larvae over the three years of the project. As I mentioned, we've got those three um, seabed restoration sites aiming to reach 50,000 people, which includes school students and also the training of citizen scientists. So the partnership that we formed, we're really excited about to have partnered with British Marine. So they're a membership organization for the UK leisure, super yacht and small commercial marine industry, which have been the company that's provided us with access to all of these marina pontoons around the country. So in total, we're working with two marinas in each of those three sites, so six in total. Um, and you can see here in this um, image just how we kind of clip the nursery into place. So if you didn't know um, the oysters were there, you, you wouldn't have a clue walking down these pontoons where really lovely boats are parked quite um, close alongside. So they fit really neatly within the existing infrastructure of these marinas. Also kind of having access to these marina sites has allowed us to develop our communications alongside the marine industry. So encouraging marine industry and sea users to be proactive by making space for nature in their marinas and also um, kind of identifying ways that they could potentially reduce pollution and also limit their impact on the marine environment. So you can see here a video um, from our colleagues at the Blue Marine Foundation, and you can see what an oyster nursery looks like when it's um, suspended underneath a marina pontoon. So when you pull up these nurseries from underneath the pontoons, often a whole ecosystem comes with it. And that's because these structures create a mini ecosystem, um, as I mentioned, kind of providing a home for hundreds of other species. And in the Solent um, project, the nurseries have previously found the critically endangered species, including the spiny seahorse and the European eel in their nurseries. 
Um, so through the course of the video, I think the fish species tend to become a bit larger and those larger fish that you can see towards the end of this video are grey mullet um, interacting with the with the nurseries um, as well. So you can see that, um, yeah, the structures can really kind of attract a range of marine biodiversity and some some kind of research that's carried is currently being carried out to try and identify what it is um, about these structures that attract the marine biodiversity and whether it is kind of the oysters themselves or if it's the kind of three-dimensional structure and we we do expect that it's it's the fact that they're oysters um kind of living in there that's attracting the marine biodiversity and i think that's due to be um kind of published and shared widely soon so I've just got a few slides remaining um, and I wanted to include some information on how you can get involved with the project. So the first would be um, oysters and tagging in our, our project. Also on the 5th of August, we it's National Oyster Day. So we'll also be sharing lots of comms on that day. So you can keep an eye out for that if you follow our social media pages. Um, yes, and so I'd encourage you to kind of follow our progress online. And also, I think I saw um, a lady in the chat at the beginning of this presentation who mentioned that they'd been volunteering at one of our sites in the northeast. Um, so again, I know that lots of people are based in London, but if you are kind of located nearby to any of our three sites, which is wild-oysters.org. And finally, um, there is a way that you can participate and help us with our kind of citizen scientists, um, science, sorry, which is through our website, which I'm just going to show you a few slides um, now. Um, so I just took some screenshots of, of what it looks like on our website. Um, so we've created a page um, called Oyster Watch, and we're asking people to help us identify species that we capture in video footage from underneath marina pontoons. And we're asking questions like how many and anything particularly interesting. And there's a note box that you can add some of your kind of notes and observations in as well. And we've also created um, a bit of an ID guide with some of the top species that you might be able to find. Um, so you can also find out more about them by clicking on them. Um, so you've got somewhere to kind of see um, and refer to when you're watching those videos. I also added in these two images on the um, right hand side and the top one is a really large European eel um, that was found in, in, in our Welsh site um, and, um, and then also it's a lovely kind of starfish that was also found in the Welsh site as well. So um, the footage that you'll re be reviewing will be kind of the underwater um, kind of snapshot into um, what our oyster nurseries look like underneath the pontoons. Um, so yeah, I would welcome you to um, engage with that if you have a spare moment. So yes, that's everything um, from me um, this evening. And thank you very much um, to Maria and, and Kieran for the opportunity to present to um, you guys this evening. And I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Celine. That was an excellent talk. Uh, I like the stress on collaboration. It was, it's been great to see that you've been working with a number of different kinds of partners and uh, the sharing of, of good practice and the guidance for best practice. That's, that's really important. Uh, I think um, stressing the value of oysters um, as part of an ecosystem, it's probably something that not everybody kind of realizes just how kind of central they are and how their nurseries and the structure that the nurseries create um, provide mm -hmm. um, an opportunity for so many different kinds of species to, to thrive. So, you know, clearly a really important project. I was shocked by the 95% of native oyster um, UK population lost in a relatively short space of time. Yes, that is, you know, really, really quite, quite startling and really worrying. But it's great to see projects, you know, kind of coming into place uh, around, around, you know, around the UK and so hopefully sort of reversing that trend. Uh, I think particularly the kind of work in collaboration with marinas, which we might mm. not always think of as a, a kind of good um, site for working on, in, you know, improving e ecosystems, it's really positive to see that. So there are there have been a few questions and comments coming through uh, on the chat already. Um, don't forget, if you'd like to ask a question in person, please raise your virtual hand and we can pick a couple of people out. But if we go over to you, David, and you pick out a few things from the chat to start off with, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks, Maria. Um... So, well, there was, there was one question which was close to what you were talking about at the end from from Cara, who's working on looking at a new oyster reintroduction project in, I guess, Lockline in Scotland. 
something like that. Um, and she was wondering, is there anything you can do to support the project? And do you have recommendations on how you can get the local community to really engage with, with the project? I'm not sure if we've got Celine. I think she I think we've dropped off the call. We may have, we may have, she, yes, we, we may I have lost she has Celine. Just dropped out. So hopefully she can re rejoin us uh, yes. again in a second or two. While we're waiting for her, just to let everybody know, I have put in the chat a link to Celine's Twitter and to her website. So um, the Wild Oysters website, which includes that Oyster Watch, there is a link there. So yeah. And you can actually save the chat if you want to save any links that we've put in the chat. Um, there, if you have the chat box open, there's a little button with three little dots. If you click on that and press save chat, it'll save a Word file, uh, a text file with all of the all of the text there for you, including any links. So that's one way that you can make sure you've got that. It'll also be on the email that Maria will send out as well as on the YouTube um, description. Right, I managed to fill that time while we got Celine back, brilliant. I'm so sorry about that. That's absolutely never happened before, but when I stopped screen sharing, everything just crashed. So I'm really sorry. Um, I hope I didn't miss much. <laughs> sorry. No, it's no problem. We, we hung on for you. It's probably the heat or something. So yeah, um, yeah we'll go back to you, David, if you wanna um, yeah. just go through that question so, again, maybe. So yeah, so there's a question from, from Cara, who's up in, um, Lock line in Scotland and working on a um, a new a new native voice introduction project up there, and she was wondering if there's anything you can do to support the project and whether you have any recommendations on how to get the local community engaged with the project. Absolutely, yes, I'd be delighted to um, kind of discuss um, further offline. So um, you can contact. Um, there's an email address via the Wild Oysters website, and I, I pick that up. That comes through my inbox. So um, yes, do feel free to get in touch. But um, in terms of engaging the local community um, through our guidance documents that we produce, that are on um, the resources link that um, I shared during the presentation, um, it's it's kind of identify as one of the key things in engaging your local case, uh, stakeholders um, as well. And there's a range of different methods that we we collated from successful projects and that have, have been established. Um, and I, I can share that document with you. I'm trying to think off the top of my mind. Um, it was, yeah, kind of early engagement is key and then kind of inviting them to volunteer um, and also get involved with the, the work that you're doing. Any kind of opportunities to um, get volunteers involved um, we, we, we encourage and I think that's one of the key ways of securing that local buy-in and, and making sure that people feel like they're a part of the project and um, know all about what, what you're planning on carrying out so there's no surprises um, down the line as well but um, yeah happy to um, discuss that further offline and I can share with you the um, guidance document that I was talking about as well. Thanks. Thanks for that offer as well, Celine. Um, just to remind you, if you do want to ask a question in person, this is a chance, chance to sort of talk to Celine direct. To, do kind of, um, you know, put your put your virtual hand up. And if anybody wants to just put their video on now, um, you're most welcome to do that as well. Uh, okay, back to you, David. Yeah. Okay. We've got. Um, let me see. It was a question here from from JK about um, we talk about them filtering all that all the pollution out, what, what toxic load can they tolerate before it becomes a, a problem for the oysters? Yeah, so we're doing a lot of research to try and um, kind of find out what what kind of the oysters can withhold. Um, in, in the Solent, there's been a um, about two years ago now, a, a three year PhD that was um, trying to find out how oysters survive and thrive in the marina environments. And obviously, marinas do tend to have um, some pollution events in them and um, it didn't kind of um, mean that all the oysters died and it's just kind of monitoring them and seeing how they kind of survive in that environment and that was the kind of um, trial and pilot stage of this wild oysters project that meant that we kind of rolled it out further in terms of the exact kind of tolerance rate I don't have that value um, to, to, to the top of my mind but they are quite hardy and, and resilient um, and they kind of, like, I've always quite surprised um, in the areas that people have found them and, and where they can survive so they are they are pretty resilient um, uh, little creatures. I'm going to go now. To, thank you for that, Celine. Um, and that's good to hear that they're kind of like holding their own. Um, I'm going to go now to Roger, who you've got your hand up. There are a couple of Rogers, but um, I think there is just uh, one who's got the hand up at the moment. If you'd like to just, yeah, you're okay. You've unmuted. If you'd like to ask your question now. Thank you. 
I'm just wondering in this question of the oysters filtering out pollution and so forth, doesn't that affect the potability, the edib edibleness of the oysters? Absolutely. So oysters that are used for um, the kind of consumption have to be grown within an area of a certain water quality and water grade. So different water bodies are graded um, differently. And in order to have a license for growing and selling oysters, they need to be within a particular grade of water body. Um, so that's the first kind of point so that you wouldn't be able to grow um, oysters in, in those particular areas that have, um, have that. And then also um, oysters that are consumed, they undergo a depuration period of, I think it's around 24 to 48 hours. So once they've been fished, they're kept in um, kind of cleaner, but still saltwater tanks. And it gives them that time period to, I guess, dispel um, kind of anything that's inside the oyster. So that's how oyster kind of fishes and commercially how people prepare, prepare oysters to be consumed. So there's a range of different things that mean that um, when you're eating an oyster, you, you won't also be kind of um, eating um, those bits as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, David, back to you. I think there were a couple of other people um, asking about the, the kind of issues around um, consuming oysters and the pollution. So Yeah, so I, th I think I think you covered JK's question about check for human health and essentially you, you, they're only grown in certain habitats. Um, Wendy was asking about microplastics and are they monitored in oysters? Um, yeah, so there's some very early research into that, and um, I know that it's more prevalent within muscle um, research on, on, on blue muscles um, to do with um, the consumption of microplastic. There was a PhD that was looking into that, but it's not completed yet, so it's still kind of very early stages, um, I'm afraid. And I also know that there's some research at the University of Portsmouth as well that's imminent to be um, published as well, but nothing nothing out there that I, I have sight on at the moment. Excellent. Uh, and since you mentioned mussels, Roger Payne's just asked about, do you know if mussel beds have suffered similar declines to oyster beds? And is, is that being looked at as well? Absolutely. So through um, kind of oyster restoration, you, obviously working in these areas, you also find out about um, kind of various other different declines in the marine environment. Um, not in my group in particular, but I do know that locally, for example, in the northeast, they're looking into... Um, muscle restoration also in Conway um, in Wales as well there's lots of research through Bangor University that's looking into the restoration of muscle beds as well so not myself but I do know that there's 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 groups doing that excellent thank you thank you, um, uh, do you sorry David yep go on it's always a, there, was a, there was a nice London question from from Monica who, who noticed that um, historically, there were oyster beds in, in the Thames um, near Billingsgate, for instance. Are, are there plans as part of your project to reintroduce oysters back into the Thames waters in London? Not not into the central, like the Thames as part of um, central London, but the Essex Native Oyster Restoration Initiative that I mentioned is located at the mouth of the River Thames. Um, so when we're kind of communicating that project, we do kind of um, mention its locality to London, but there, there's no plans to restore in, in the kind of central um, River Thames area. It'd be lovely if you could. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking the same, actually. We, yeah, it, but it's probably not you know kind of an appropriate um why location. not the river is is so filthy and mm. it's getting cleaner and it would just be so lovely to have it cleaner further inland yeah um, i think so yeah. many people are using central london now um, absolutely i think I'm, I'm finding like shells that are 500 years old that were obviously still growing there i found like a whole reef like wow. down there which is unbelievable I, I mean literally I found one shell that was still fused together and I opened it up and it was full of mud but it must wow. be it must be four four five hundred years old oh that's so, amazing do you have a photo of it I'd love to I, see that I've got it I can email it to you oh, yes please I would do. love to talk to you about it yeah. I found this whole bed that is just fascinating oh I'd my goodness to... yeah yeah, let, uh, yeah yeah feel free to email and it'd yeah. be great to connect on that because that's okay. fascinating I think the main problem now in the River Thames would be the sediment on the bottom um, and the suitability of that substrate um, because at the moment I, I don't I don't know too much about the Thames but I just I can't envisage that the oyster larvae would be able to settle on that sediment without introducing as I was mentioning the kind of culture material which would come with a whole manner of marine licensing and permissions to do but I'd love to talk about it further it'd be great okay, to see great. that okay. shell. <laughs> Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, David, can we maybe talk about the, I like that, I thought that was it. I was just going the to the Pacific, Pacific. yeah. I was, right, I was, okay, thank yeah, you. So, so, so Fiona asked um, whether the Pacific oyster is considered to be an invasive species, um, yeah. whether you can tell how, how early in their life cycle you can tell the difference between the two. You, you showed us nice how to do it for adults and whether we should go around consciously squishing the, the, the non-native spat. Oh, that's a brilliant question. So the first question is that it is recognised by the government as an invasive non-native species. Um, the second um, answer would be it's really hard to tell the difference between a native oyster larvae and a Pacific oyster larvae. Some specialists in the field swear that they can identify it when the oysters are still the size of a less than a pound coin. Um, so around like a 5p coin, they say that they can identify it and it's all to do with the darkening of particular areas because they can start to see that purple coloration apparently, but I can't see it with my own eyes. Um, so for me, it would probably be when they were kind of around one years old, um, when they start to kind of grow a few, few more centimeters in length. Um, so it's, it's very hard to do, but you can do it, um, supposedly. I wouldn't trust myself <laughs> in doing it because it's so, so small at that stage. Um, and then finally, yes, in terms of, um, efforts in place to remove Pacific oysters. I know that I've heard in along the South Coast, I think in areas such as Kent, there's been some trials on, um, on removing Pacific oysters. Um, the work that we do, we don't, we, we don't um, kind of do that, but I, I am aware that that is something that some groups are, are doing. And because everything that we're doing is quite new, um, we're still researching. I don't know if it's um, effective or not at this stage, but um, an interesting, interesting method nonetheless. Uh, let me let me combine a couple of questions. So we had a question from JK about whether climate change and water temperature is making a difference to the the conservation of them and where they could where they could be reintroduced. And a more general question from Chiara is what what has been the most recent challenges for oyster conservation? Yeah. Um, so the answer to the first one, um, as you can see in the life cycle um, graphic, oyster spawning and um, like with most animals, you know, it's it's governed by um, temperature. So obviously climate change and changing in um, kind of sea temperature will impact oysters. Um, I would say, again, they are quite resilient and we do um, there's research being carried out to see just how resilient they are and how tolerant they are of temperature changes. So I know at the University of Portsmouth, they've set up a um, uh, oyster hatchery um, that was established a few months ago and they've got oysters um, in different temperatures, tanks and kind of researching how they're faring with that um, as well, which is which is very interesting. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second question? And what, what has been the most sort of yeah. recent challenges for oyster conservation? Yeah. I think for me in my role, it's um, kind of sharing the benefit of oyster restoration. And I've been focusing my efforts on trying to, to share that and um, kind of providing people with the tools on how to do it. Um, there's also with the setup of all of these projects, it costs an awful lot of money um, to do, um, particularly at the scale that you need for it to be successful. You have to introduce really huge volumes of that shell substrate, which can be very expensive. And also any modifications to the seabed requires a lot of work and, and permissions and licensing to do as well. Um, so there's there are a lot of challenges, uh, but for me in my role, I'd say um, kind of, sharing the benefits and, and why we're trying to restore oysters and, and, and trying to kind of rejig that living memory of, of native oysters is something that I've been focusing on. Excellent, thank you. And I think we only had one other question that's not been answered so far, which um, was another from JK, who's, who's clearly really interested in this to in the topic of oysters today. Um, JK was asking, how do you combat the problem of oyster theft? Oyster theft. Oh yeah, that is a, yeah. So people p do poach oysters in 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 the site that I'm working in in Scotland. Um, there are some um, areas that have been um, kind of recognised as as their kind of oyster reefs and existing remnant oyster reefs, which is really exciting because we've got the opportunity to contribute towards the restoration of of some wild um, beds there. Um, and yeah, poaching does happen, and it's it's really hard to regulate. So with the project, as the wild oysters project, we've tried to we're still in the process of deciding where to do our seabed restoration and, mm. and in those locations we'll try and restore them in areas that have a level of protection already um so that's one way of doing it also in the marina sites that we've chosen they're obviously private marinas so um 
There's also CCTV. They're behind a locked gate um, of the marina because most marinas have a locked gate on exit and entry. So there's that element of security for our particular project. But um, in terms of UK wide, it's it's something that's really hard to regulate. And we're still trying to kind of look into ways of, of doing that. And I guess taking a small number of oysters for your tea is is perhaps at a sustainable level. But then when it comes to, you know, um, taking large numbers, then that's when it starts to become a problem. Can I, can I ask you something a bit more about the cultural value mm. side? Or, um, because obviously you were talking about the sort of those two people that in, in Essex where mm. there was obviously a very long kind of generation after generation um, linked with oyster fishing. Is, is that something that you, you found generally or, or is that quite rare now to find that sort of level of continuity? Mm. Generally around the UK, so in Essex, that's the main example of like a pure collaboration with those oyster fishers. And also in the Solent, there's some kind of shellfish growers that are involved as well. Um, and trying to think about it. And there's also kind of fisheries that supply, um, you know, for commercial markets, but they're also interested in restoration. So they're still involved, but it is more of a kind of historical, you know, um, a thing like in all of these places that we've selected, there's evidence of um, kind of previous booms in the oyster industry. And um, I think I was mentioning before this talk um, to Anne um, that Anki, um, that there's, um, kind of in the northeast there's a road called oyster road and along that there was a house um that was all kind of full of oysters on the outside of it so um it shows that you know oysters were once a kind of really um kind of interesting area for people to kind of um you know be interested in um i'm trying to think off the top of my head but yeah it's it's more along the south coast where there's the existing um fishes that are involved with restoration because I just noticed a couple of people in the chat sort of commenting about, you know, within their um, memory, they had remembered times when there were more oysters around mm. and now there are there are de declined. I, I was just sort of interested about is is there this kind of folk memory of oys, you know, oyster, the pre oysters being prevalent or, or does that has that largely been lost? Mm. From my experience, I personally feel that it's largely been lost, but yeah. I'd love to um, to read those um, those comments. I, unfortunately, I've lost the chat because I left, but um, I'd be really interested in seeing those. Um, but from the most of the work that I do, I suppose um, at kind of outreach events and um, and things I, I've not really heard many um, recollections of of living memories but I'd be really interested if anyone um, uh, to see those comments if anyone wanted to get in touch. Thank, thank you very much Celine so you know and it, thank you for you know sharing your email the way that people can contact you by email and uh, you know Celine is genuinely interested in in kind of getting in talking things through and in getting and getting to know more about what other people are doing and other projects going on so please do get in touch if you would like to that would be great um we're we're going to wind things up now unless there's anybody that's got one last question do pop it in the chat there's just a couple of minutes if you if there is something you burning question you'd like to ask we're getting lots of nice comments coming through people saying thank you and they've you know really enjoyed the talk and found it you know very informative really interesting so thank you very much and for sticking with it on a very hot evening so you get deserve a kind of bonus point for doing that really so it's great there's it really it was really well worth um watching and i'm going to certainly have a, another look at the recording when it goes onto the youtube channel to just have a look at the bits and pieces that i missed as we were kind of like keeping things going um so thank you again to Celine you've, for got, a great... you've got a hand raised there oh, I've got a ha oh I've got, I thought I might tempt somebody okay that's great JK would you like to ask your no, question I can't, I can't resist telling you um our use for oyster shells when I was a child was to, ch to bash them up and feed them to the chickens because oh, they're really? excellent for the chicken um hens eggs the wow. nature shells of the eggs um you know more solid for, for fascinating chicken, um short on grit oh amazing that's really cool actually use the shells wow <laughs> brilliant great to know thanks for sharing that thank nice. you <laughs> Yeah, that's another important thing that oysters have yes. been able to contribute then as well. So that, that's great. Thank you very much for adding that. So thank you ever so much for everybody for coming and for taking part. 
Um, our next talk is going to be on Thursday, the 5th of August. Coincidentally, that's now, which I didn't know, National Oyster Day. Um, and it's going to be the third in our joint series with the Ecology and Conservation Studies Society. That's going to be Ken Thompson, and he'll be talking about gardening for wildlife. Um, he's particularly going to focus on the Sheffield's Bugs Project, which looks to look to the wildlife in a range of gardens to try and help answer the question, what makes a good wildlife garden? We've got a good number of people already booked for that, but we have got some spaces um, and so there's still room for a few more. So if people haven't signed up already, then please do. Please see our website for details of all our talks. Sign up to the mailing list and you'll get our virtual talks newsletter. And as Kieran um, promised, there's one on its way very soon. Um, we do hope to see you all again soon and um, hope you have a very nice rest of the evening and manage to <laughs> manage to kind of get through uh, and not struggle too much with the, the sort of nighttime temperatures as well. Again, in London, it has been pretty hot. Thank you so much um, again to Celine. Thank you for everyone for coming. And thank you. We've got a couple of claps as well. That's